again. Welcome to Ghost Chronicles Next Generation, the Benford Hall edition. All right. I am Ron Kolick, um, Lord of this manor. <laughs> like that would ever happen. And with me is Lady uh, Blondie here. And Lady welcome Aspen. to the eighth show. This is the eighth show? Eighth yes, show is. of um, Ghost Chronicles Next Generation. And we're here at the EBC TV with our live audience. Yay, there you go. And so this is exciting, isn't it? It is exciting. You know, I love that opening. I can't help. Well, I mean, I really do. Thank you very much. We put our creative juices together and yes, we did. well, that didn't sound good. We put our creative brains together on that one and it came out really good. And blatantly stole it from Downton Abbey, but, you know. Any, any, any resemblance to the original one is strictly <laughs> accidental. <laughs> Including the music. But it was fun to make. And we it was a to. blast, actually. And we, we want to do more of those, too, right? Because we can. Because we can. <laughs> and Bedford Hall was so much fun. We did an investigation two weeks ago now. That's Not right. Quite. It's the second time I've been here, but that's in Lenox, Massachusetts, yes. which is way to hell. It is. It's farther out than... It's the other side of the state. But it is. Uh, so we are. It was a great time, though, right? It was awesome. Yeah. And we are dedicating this evening's show to Ventford Hall. To Ventford Hall, yeah. and is it's that Ventford with a T or a D? It's Ventford with a T. Yeah. Ventfort, Ventfort, mm -hmm. which means strong wind. It Bent does. Fort means strong wind. Oh, yes, I it thought does. it meant breaking wind. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Only at your house. Okay. Only at your house. Anyway. So. So, I mean, we did have a great time. It was, uh, they were gracious, mm -hmm. very gracious, mm -hmm. right? And yes. you did have that hot shake bathtub, too. <laughs> so, should we tell the story? Let's I think oh, we have to tell that story. So, we go to check into the hotel, which is about, I don't know, five, ten miles down, not even ten miles down the road from Benford Hall. And uh, Ron says, all right, you p you're driving, so you pick out which room that you'd like to have. So... Uh, two queens or the king? Two queens or a king. So naturally I said, I'd like a king. Thank you. So we check in. Uh, but I thought you should be queen because and she the, is a queen. The guy, <laughs> the guy says to us, oh, well, the, the king room has a jacuzzi. And Ron says, well, that figures. Mm -hmm. So anyways, I go to the room. I open the door. And there. Oh, I, first I said, I'll give it to my daughter. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let my daughter have that room. So. I open the door to the hotel room, and there's the biggest, reddest, heart-shaped tub, jacuzzi tub, I have ever seen. Don't forget the mirrors. Oh, my God. All mirrored. There were no mirrors on the ceiling. Thank God. So, um, yes, Anne got the tacky room. But uh, tacky? anyway. That was the classy room. That, that was cost that. more money. <laughs> that was that. Jeez. Sweet, I guess. Uh, and Ghost so. Chronicles paid for that, so that was... Yes, uh, yeah, they did. We thank so. Ghost Chronicles on all our listeners. Thank you very much. Because you send all those donations in to us that really drives this show. And we're paid so highly. Yeah, exactly. So, so anyways. Oh, my goodness. So, so anyways, uh, we, we did an investigation, which we're going to talk about with our guests a little bit later on. And the next day, we shot the opening for uh, the show, today's show. Yes. And also, we did one of Anne's favorite things. We went to a cemetery. I was wondering if you know what your favorite thing was. <laughs> that is one of my favorite, mm -hmm. very favorite things. So right. Should we introduce that? Yes, and so the, the cemetery we went to was? We went to a beautiful cemetery called Church on the Hill Cemetery, and it's right in uh, downtown Lenox. And um, I think without further ado, we should play that clip. I think so. Welcome to Cemetery Tripping, where I will feature a different cemetery in each episode that I hope you will seek out and enjoy as much as I do. As an avid taphophile, or lover of tombstones, I spend a lot of time in the local New England area in the beautiful and historic cemeteries we have here. The stones here are like no others, and I have literally thousands of pictures of the intricate and symbolic carvings found on them. You can see my pictures on Facebook by doing a search for Cemetery Tripping. Today I'd like to talk about a cemetery that is very close to Venford Hall in downtown Lenox, Mass, and is named Church on the Hill Cemetery, a congregational church located at the corner of Main and Greenwood Streets. 
Interred here is one of the owners of the original house that stood on the site of Ventford Hall, which was simply called Vent Fort, meaning strong wind. The house was built for Ogden and Elizabeth Haggerty, and their daughter Annie was courted by Robert Gould Shaw, who led the first regiment of African-American soldiers in the Civil War, the Massachusetts 54th. True to its name, the cemetery sits high on a hill behind the church that is its namesake. Upon entering the cemetery, I was immediately struck by how many intricately carved depictions of willows I saw. All different, all beautiful, from simple to quite elaborate, and probably the biggest collection I have ever seen in one place. Some other interesting stones in the cemetery are found on the back side in the newer section. One of them a winged pegasus, which adorns the grave of Rufus Lenoir Patterson III, a World War II fighter pilot who died in action over Germany in September 1944, and also the grave of the Bishop of the Diocese of Western Massachusetts from 1911 to 1936, Thomas F. Davies. Many of the more ornate stones can be attributed to the wealthy residents of Lenox during the late 1700s and early 1800s, as it was a busy courthouse community where lawyers, clergymen, writers, businessmen, and artists lived. With the development of the railroad system, Lenox became the summer home of wealthy Bostonians and New Yorkers. The Haggertys were part of that wealthy circle, and their daughter Annie met her future husband, Robert Gould Shaw, at a pre-opera dinner party in New York during the Civil War. When Shaw was offered a promotion to lead the Massachusetts 54th Regiment of All Black Soldiers, he wrote to Annie and asked, Please tell me, without reservation, what you think about it, for I am very anxious to know. Annie encouraged him to take the position, and with their parents' reluctant consent, they were married during the spring of 1863, while Shaw recruited and trained the regiment. They had a short four-day honeymoon at Ventfort before Shaw had to leave to join his regiment in Boston on May 9th. Three months later, Annie Shaw became a widow at age 28 when Colonel Shaw was killed at Fort Wagner on Morris Island, South Carolina. Annie lived the remainder of her life as a widow in France and Switzerland with her aging mother and her younger sister's family, but eventually returned to the United States. At middle age, Annie became an invalid and spent the last summer of her life in her old family home in Lenox, dying on March 17, 1907, at her sister's home in Boston at the age of 71. She was buried in the church on the Hill Cemetery next to her mother, sister, and brother-in-law. Perhaps Annie is one of the ghosts who still walks at Fenford Hall, wishing for the return of her heroic husband, Robert. You'll just have to visit and see for yourself. Wow, that was just terrific. <laughs> uh, hide your enthusiasm. Hide your enthusiasm. Well, you, you know, Anne, I, I do have to admit, I really love your hat. Thank you. It's so you. It really is. I love my hat, and I want to give a shout out to Mrs. Swifts and Moore, and where Moore? I bought this hat this really? afternoon, this very afternoon. Because Seriously? Yes. Mm. Mrs. Swifts and Moore, which is also haunted, but we're going to talk about that on another show. Right. <laughs> I actually bought a hat this afternoon, too. You did? It was just like this, only different. Only better? Uh, yeah, better. Better and different, except it was like 16 sizes too big. <laughs> <laughs> so it well, didn't come out good. I think we need to introduce our guests. So anyways, uh, without further ado, uh, we'd like to introduce uh, somebody who I've known for a long time uh, and investigated many, many times with. Um, is it not only uh, a, a good investigator, but also a good friend. He is uh, Josh Mantello of Berkshire Paranormal. Hello. Thanks for uh, having me. Come on. You didn't have to dress up, by the way. <laughs> I, I feel so underdressed, um, and my head feels naked. <laughs> you should get Josh a hat. Oh, it's my fault. Gosh too, darn right? it. Yeah. I missed the memo. For him? My fault again. Okay. So, Josh, you are uh, the one of the founders of uh, Berkshire Paranormal, and you are also was the host of this event that we did at uh, Bedford Hall. Is that right, Bedford? Yes, you did. Okay. Yes, you did. So, I mean, how did you get involved in the paranormal? And, and tell us more about Bedford Hall, how you got hooked up with them. Um, well, I got involved in the paranormal going on a, about 10 years now. Uh, we... Uh, Myself and my father, um, Nick, 
we're members of a, a Masonic lodge in North Adams, uh, pretty well known itself as the Houghton Mansion. Oh, uh, the Illuminati. And we, we were members of the lodge, and the building had a long story of being haunted. So we, at one point, decided, let's get one of these crazy ghost hunting people to, to come in <laughs> and, and investigate the building. And, you know, there was only one name on the top of that list that came up, and that was Ron, and then oh. it was a ghost project. So, so did you Google uh -huh. crazy ghost hunted people? Crazy Is that how I got involved? Well, honestly, I don't know if there was a Google call. that long ago. Yeah, Google ghost hunting people. <laughs> but, you know, so, you know, the, we did that investigation that night, and it was just uh, amazing, you know, watching the process and, and being part of it. So we, from that point on, just started buying our own equipment and calling around and asking questions and how do you do this and how do you do that and reading books and, you know, really got you, into it. And it's, it was like one of those little kids in the neighborhood that are like six years old. How do you do that? What's oh, that so for? <laughs> what do you need that? No, just kidding. Yeah, you know, so, you know, that it really spiraled into what eventually became Berkshire Paranormal, um, you know, and we started investigating private homes and other locations. We really got a name for ourselves around, uh, you know, kind of running a haunted mansion, not a haunted as in jump out and scare you haunted, but a actual... Although at times. Yeah, at times. You know, a mansion that is known to be haunted. So uh, about a year and a half ago, um, the current, or not the current, the then house manager of Ventford Hall um, gave us a call. Um, they had worked with another group in the past who's, who had done some level of um, ghostly events and paranormal things. They kind of wanted to continue that. Um, they, they, they heard of our reputation of what we did um, up with our other locations. So they said, what can you do with us? And um, we did one event. They really liked it and decided at that point, let's uh, you know, kind of build an a ongoing relationship where we can more or less act as their paranormal liaisons. So if somebody needs anything kind of ghostly related, they will contact us, who will then in turn contact them with any sort of proposals or, 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 or paranormal needs for, um, for their building. Um, I got a really cool, you know, as an example, I had a really cool request. that ended up falling through. They backed out of it. But a, a couple that was getting married, and they were going to actually have their wedding at Ventford Hall, which, okay. as you see some more of the clips and stuff is, is coming up, it's a very beautiful place. It's a great place to hold a wedding. Mm -hmm. And they, um, they're obviously, they were ghost hunting fans. So they said, after the rehearsal dinner the night before, or after the rehearsal the night before, they want to know, can they stay and ghost hunt for a couple hours? And ah. they were going to actually have us go down and spend two or three hours of the entire wedding party ghost hunting the night before <laughs> the, uh, the wedding. You know, something had fallen through. Awesome. Uh, what it is, I don't know. But, you know, it, it, felt, you know, it, it didn't happen. But... You know, so whenever something comes up, we're kind of doing that for them now. Mm -hmm. Wow, that, that's different. Well, that is really different. You know, it's funny because I had a similar experience, you know, every year for the past 11 years, I've done this event called Spectral Events. And mm -hmm. of course, you did it with right? me once. Yep. Mm -hmm. You said you'd never do it again. But <laughs> but uh, Salem in October. Yes, October, yeah. Busy. So <laughs> we actually had a couple that postponed their wedding so they could go to the event. So it's kind of the reverse wow. of what George is. I mean, George, did you change his name? <gasps> Wait a minute, George. George. Am I getting something? Wait a minute, where's Channeling. the K2 meter? <laughs> we have, okay, I don't know, baby's coming through. I think we should, we should give the people uh, a little history of Ventford Hall. What okay. Do you, what do you think about that? Do I have a say in the matter? No. Oh. <laughs> so there you go. Well, you know, we're talking about this place, and um, nobody's really familiar with the history. Oh, that would make um, sense. We do have a clip that we can play. Do we want to play the clip with, Absolutely. with uh, Trevor? Yeah. Um, this is uh, a fellow that Josh introduced us to, and uh, uh, he is the manager, is it? He's currently the house manager for the building, so he uh, helps organize the tours and uh, some of the events and things that go on. Okay, so why don't we play contact. that then with uh, Trevor? We'll hear a little yes. about the history of the, the mansion. Here in Sarah's room at Benford Hall, Thank and you. we're speaking with Trevor Dean, who is the manager at the hall. Trevor, can you tell us a little bit about the history of the house? Well, we're at a Benford Hall. It was built by Sarah Morgan, who was the sister of J.P. Morgan. They built this house in 1893, cost her about $900,000, equivalent of, give or take, $22, $25 million nowadays. So as you can uh, imagine, it's quite elaborate. <laughs> Um, but this isn't the first house on the property. The first house belonged to the Haggerty family, and Robert Goodshaw of the 54th Massachusetts Regiment actually spent his honeymoon here with Annie Haggerty a 
few months before he went off to die at Fort Wagner. And uh, shortly after, you know, parents sold off the house and then the Morgans moved it across the street and built the lovely Benford Hall that is here now. But uh, sadly, Sarah died three years after the building of the house in 1893. So her husband George got to stay here until about 1913, 1912 when he passed away. And then uh, from then on, the children didn't live here. They sold off the furnishings, rented the house to the Bonzo family who stayed here for 20, 30 years. Then they sold off, became an inn called Festival House. A few years later, became a ballet school. Then became a dormitory for an organization called The Bible Speaks fell into great disrepair, and now we're here in Sarah's room. As you can see, that it's been completely fixed up. When we got a hold of the building, there had been some major holes in the ceiling, some of the foundation had started coming apart. So there was about an inch of ice on the floors. You could see from the basement all the way to the sky, four floors up. So it was in pretty bad shape, uh, but we've spent about $4 million in repairs, and we've only got the first and second floor done. So it's, you can imagine it's going to be a little bit more before we can finish the rest of the house. But this is one of the rooms that we've finished all the way, so hopefully the goal is to have every room looking this nice when we're done. Um, now, Venford Hall is <coughs> haunted. Who, who do we think is haunting? Uh, people say maybe Sarah's back because she never really wanted to leave. But you know, it could be for a variety of reasons. It served so many masters over the years, been so many things. So. You know, someone could have just really enjoyed here, and there's just tons of impressions. So we don't really know of anyone, per se, dying here, but there's just been so much activity going on, so many people, so many lives affected by this place, that it's really hard to say who it could be, but we'd like to find out. Uh, you just hear slamming doors, footsteps when you're the only one here. You get smell of perfume at times. You know, people that have been here have said they felt a, a hand kind of brush their hair, just set on the back of their head, and a few other things. People have had stuff kind of thrown at them, not really sure if it fell, if it was thrown. Just a few odd things, but mostly just the, the noises, the, the creaking, the, the walking, the door shutting. Those are the more common ones. So, how about that? There you go. So that was uh, Travis from the mansion. So Trevor. 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 Travis. Trevor, Ron has a problem with this guy's name. He called him. He kept calling him Travis. I'm like, it's Trevor. Like Ventura, I think the kid Ventura. just, he finally gave up. He said, all right, I've, I've whatever, whatever. I've whatever. so many people whatever in my life. Me. You're lucky I still remember oh, your name. Oh, my God. Anyways, um, but. that was, uh, it was pretty cool. And uh, Josh, I mean, you haven't investigated other than those two events, right? Not yet. No. Uh, there, there are plans to go down in smaller groups and a little bit more of a formal investigation. Mm -hmm. But uh, everything so far has actually been in larger groups and more of a mm -hmm. event format than um, your uh, what we would call maybe a formal investigation. Right. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that uh, John in the, the chat room, John in the Tojinet chat room, has a question for you. But um, if you do have a question, uh, either in the Tojinet chat room or in East Bridgewater, where we are, right? Yes. Or um, on the Toji Net chat room, go in. We've got some right. awesome people there taking questions. So anyway, yes. uh, John, you want to ask a question? Ah, well, John from our Toji Net chat room wants to know if we had a good time investigating with Josh at Fenford Hall. So let's switch it around and find out if Josh had a good time investigating with us. Okay. Well. <laughs> I had a fantastic time. Uh, whenever I have an opportunity to, to investigate with Ron and, and, and anybody, um, you know, Ron usually brings out or I every now and then will venture to this side of the state and, and investigate. It was always a good time. Um, you know, there's always a certain level of entertainment um, you bring to things, you know, which I, I love. What does that mean? <laughs> um, it, you know, it's Ron is always entertaining. <laughs> You know, I think, you know, you know, when we had, we split up in, in specific groups where myself and Ron got the group of maybe 15, 18 people who had never investigated before, had mm -hmm. never been on a ghost hunt and didn't know uh, a K2 from their elbow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and had a, they all had a blast, you know. For those who don't know, show them what a K2 was. This is a K2. This is your elbow. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, there you go. 
<laughs> they, um, you know, we were able to actually, you know, some of your more seasoned, hardcore ghost hunters, they just go off and do their own little thing. Right. You know, with those groups, you're able to actually kind of do some more uh, less scientific and fun ways of interacting with spirits mm -hmm. in the building. And uh, I, I had nothing but great reviews from the people who contacted me afterwards saying this was fantastic. I can't wait to do it again. You guys were so entertaining, but we learned a lot at the same time. So I had a blast. And from what I heard, everybody else on the most part had a blast as well mm -hmm. yeah it was it was decent um it was funny because we we're going to divide the groups up to equals but uh it's like everybody jo wanted to be in josh and my group it's like <laughs> in ann's group and my group too i yeah. said ann i had your name <laughs> i just couldn't get it all out at once you know <laughs> so josh i mean I, I went on the internet and i actually went on the youtube uh station whoever it's called that thing you put things on, in the, on the internet. Yes. The YouTubes. YouTubes. And um, there was another group that investigated that place. Did you see that video at all at any time? I, I've, I've seen bits and pieces of it. Yeah. Um, I believe it was a group out of Chicopee. Yeah, well, Chicopee. there was also, you know, the TAPS team that investigated as well because it was featured on, on the... Um, Ghost Hunters on Sci-Fi right. once too, so you can catch wow. either of those videos um, usually through YouTube at one point or another. I've I've seen bits and pieces of it. Mm -hmm. um, what I have seen is maybe a couple little EVPs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now so, I know when when we were with our group um, in the well, I call it the attic, but it was actually the third floor. I call it the hat room. The hat room. The hat room. But uh, guess who wore a hat? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I can't imagine. Uh, I can't me imagine neither. you. Mm, no. But uh, so we were up in the um, third floor, mm -hmm. and which is really just used for storage right now. And that seemed to be the liveliest room of our evening of investigations. And Josh, you were there yeah. when we had a couple of different things happen. You know, the the two times that we've been there um, so far, that has been the most active location in the building for me. I've had a few things happen in other parts of the building, which is enormous. I mean, mm -hmm. we spread nearly 60 people out to the point where you could almost walk and still feel alone in the building, and there were still almost a quarter of the building was shut off to the, to everybody. Right. So it's so enormous. You know, to have, you know, we had small occurrences in different parts of the building, but in that, that the hat room, I guess, <laughs> it, it really, it, it, oh, we we've now it given it a name, um, <laughs> you know, the hat room, you know, has consistently really been the most active. Uh, we don't know whose room it was, but you know, from what I understand, it was one of the um, the sons possibly had mm -hmm. um, lived in that room. Mm -hmm. wow. And I have to admit, I, you know, Josh and I took basically turns in each of the locations. And, and I love to just sit back and watch Josh work at times because it's kind of cool. I mean, I know what I do and, well, actually I don't know what I do, uh, but uh, anyway, yeah, when I don't know what I'm doing, <laughs> uh, but I get to watch someone else, it's kind of cool. And Josh uh, twice did that room, uh, led the group in that room. The first time I did it was really, really interesting with uh, objects actually being thrown. And mm -hmm. I, I haven't seen that too much in my years of investigating, but. Uh, the first time I was there with you was really interesting. Uh, you want to tell us about it, Josh? Yeah, it's it's funny, you know, in a, a decade of investigating, I've had objects get thrown three times and twice have been in that building. So, <laughs> you know, it, it's obviously something that happens there. Um, Maybe so, they just don't like you there. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just you know, saying. You know, I, I have gotten, gotten a reputation with some <laughs> spirits here and there to um, for them to not like me so much. So uh, maybe this one is, I've gotten in his or her bad side up there. Mm. Um, but, you know, the first time we were there back in November of 13, we had a group, you know, 10 to 13 people uh, up in that hat room. And as we were getting into the investigating, and investigating is usually a lot of talking and hopefully something reacts back. And, you know, we had gotten to the point where it was, you know, this is one of the son's rooms. And, you know, somebody had made mention that, you know, oh, the son, you know, like to party a little bit and enjoy a good cigar and maybe a drink from time to time and also you know maybe have a few lady friends up in the bedroom <laughs> and no. so we were saying hey you know there's some guys and girls up here how do you what would you say about you know having a cigar now maybe you know we'll, we'll get some whiskey out and meet or some scotch and we'll have a few drinks and shoot some pool or play some cards and you know one of the women who was sitting next to me you know suddenly feels something rub up against her leg <laughs> And she goes, oh, 
you know, and she kind of jumps and what, you know, she, what was that? And I was, it wasn't me. It wasn't, she goes, something just rubbed my leg, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, we think that's kind of suspicious and we continue to kind of just ask those same questions again. And she feels something on her leg again. So we're like, oh, is this, are you trying to tell us you just want the ladies in the room and you want us guys to leave? <laughs> and we hear, you know, a, a solid object just kind of hit the floor. Um, I really wish I had you know, a good way to describe it. You know, it's interesting. You, you're talking this story, and the K2 meter is going off like crazy. Oh, that's it funny. Is. <laughs> <laughs> so, Good. Maybe they followed us. They followed us. You, yeah. you. Don't, don't break this. Though. Throw something oh, no. else. No, no, no. <laughs> and so, you know, we hear this solid object kind of just hit the floor. So, you know, we all kind of stop for a minute to see what it is, and we, you know, get our flashlights out. And there was a small piece of asphalt... Um, roofing tile mm -hmm. in the middle of the room you know maybe inch and a half by inch rectangle mm -hmm. and like, where'd that come from He's, nobody really knows you know, or maybe it was there before you know whatever pick it up i put it in my pocket and <laughs> we go back into the to the lines of questioning again you know we're asking these same questions because we were getting some sort of reaction and sure enough we hear the same sound again kind of dropping on the floor so, what was it this time so we have another piece of tile sitting on the floor mm -hmm. so it actually it happened three times that night you wow. know where we're asking it's like hey you want the guys to leave you want to stay here with the ladies up in the yes. up in the bedroom and sure enough the little piece of tile would, would fall on the floor um now this just two three weeks ago we were back in the same room mm -hmm. and actually a little bit of a bigger crowd and now at this time we actually had a few people thinking they were seeing a shadow right. kind of popping in and out of the doorway. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a piece of equipment that can actually set off an alarm when it, it detects shadows. So I was trying to set that up and, you know, mess with this piece of equipment. It's making all sorts How of noise. How does that work? It has a, you know, so I have a beam of light that comes out of it like this. Yeah. So you point the light at it and it actually has a light sensor. On the oh, front okay. of it, so, so if anything if breaks any, it, so it's just like a an not even, IR. Uh, not even thingy. if anything breaks it. If there's any variance, if the light gets any dimmer or brighter, yeah. it sets off an alarm. So okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, so I'm trying to get that set up so that the lights facing each other and all this, and all of a sudden, and there were there was two other gentlemen with me. All of a sudden, the, we hear something, and this like whipped, it's like yeah. flies across the room. It makes a really loud noise and bounces around and lands, and it was a penny that yeah. had somehow flown across the room <laughs> and <laughs> and landed kind of right by us. So I'm like, just, you know, I'm a skeptical ghost hunter. You know, part mm -hmm. of, there's always going to be a little something in the back of my head that says somebody in this room just threw a penny at me. Right. <laughs> you know, but, right. you know, I'm not blaming anybody. I looked around, they, everybody in the room seemed pretty like, wow, I can't believe that just happened. Nobody seemed like, I just <laughs> threw the penny. <laughs> I, you, know, you know, so, but, you know, something chucked that penny across the room kind of right in our direction so right. definitely a room where something gets tossed around quite frequently right really interesting you were there at that time right yes mm -hmm. yes I was you didn't there. throw a penny did you? i did not throw the penny okay, i was over with my hat besides it's hard to get in the pot with any money anyway <laughs> this is true uh, right. but anyway <clears throat> so with the penny when it was was it tossed or did it fall or i'm trying to figure out uh, it sounded like it was tossed it, yeah, it, it, so you, you know, didn't see it then no right? i didn't yeah see it kind of came down with a little bit it. of force yeah, yeah i know, thought it, i yeah, personally it, thought you know i could almost hear it go by my head like <laughs> it, it was it was moving and it bounced around it had some speed to it when it were from wherever it came from mm. Maybe yeah. it was Ron. You were over there on the other side i was i ah. was you know the interesting thing about it too is the first time that um you were there and this tossing happened and with the little uh, asphalt. Um, there was a guy that was actually taking pictures and he had a camera up and one of them came down and uh, he thought he had it, but uh, it didn't show up at all. Um, and also, well, <clears throat> excuse me, I was monitor monitoring the room with my little IR camera. Right. So I was kind of, mm -hmm. I could see, IR lets you see in the dark, so you virtually it's daylight. So I, could, I was looking around and I didn't see anybody flipping or tossing mm -hmm. or, or anything, and, you know, because I was looking after the first one. I think it, did it happen three times or two times? I forget now. That, that first night it happened three times. Three times. So I remember so. going down at the end of the night and um, asking who, the house manager at the time then, I believe mm -hmm. his name was Cameron, you know, saying, hey, 
do you, do you, these things, is, is there any reason why you guys have little one-inch square tiles floating <laughs> around upstairs? He's like, no. You know, and we found a, a stack of tiles. They were, they you know, were but full they were tiles. Full right. tiles. They and and they, were, they were new tiles versus these, which seemed to be older, right? Right. Yeah. So, you know, I remember placing them down. I was like, well, whatever's upstairs, threw these at us. And I, and I wish I picked <laughs> them up and took them home for a souvenir, but I left them on the counter. And so oh. Somebody probably cleaned them up and threw them away. Threw them away. But probably. Right. What a waste. There might be some we could have checked it for ectoplasm. That's what I was going to say. There could be some spectral <laughs> evidence on it. Here, take a sample. <laughs> I don't know. Well, uh, yeah, I don't know about that, but and I mean, I think that various people had personal experiences as well. I know we were in the room that um, kind of has been designated as the nursery. Oh yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And we were in there. That was, I think, towards the end of our time Oh, that time was a new, very unique. I don't know. If, yeah, was Josh here or not? I don't I think he no, was. No, I don't was. think he was. I think I was. Uh, you, yeah. Why don't you tell us about that, Ian? Well. Yeah, I don't, I don't think Josh was there, and I, I think we kind of, like, we had some people in there, but yeah. not everybody. This was late at the end of the night. Yeah, right? it was towards the end of the night, and so we went into this small room that was, you know, they said, well, this is the nursery. It may not have, we don't know what it, it, it originally was. So, it, But it had children's toys in there, and it was set up with, like, a little crib, and so we all kind of settled in there, and we were trying, we were hoping to communicate with any children. And one of the men, we were kind of sitting over on the, the window seats, he said, I feel like I'm gonna cry. <laughs> and I, I, it's kind of an odd thing, you know, for a guy to say. And he said, I'm not usually like this. <laughs> but he said, I just feel this overwhelming- did he actually cry though? See, he was. Yeah. He, he said, I feel this overwhelming sense of sadness in this particular room. And he said, I don't have any idea why I'm crying. And uh, that had happened to me once before in another investigation, you know, somewhere else. And I couldn't explain it either. But mm -hmm. he just had this feeling come over him and couldn't control it. Right. That was that was really interesting. So did you ever have anything happen like that to you, Josh? Did you ever want to cry? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no. I, I've had some more of a... Only when you see me? Only when I see you. It's <laughs> just so sad. <laughs> no. Um, there, there's been a few times where I've gotten almost an anger. Um, so you had the opposite. Whoops. And almost an opposite sensation, yeah. I, I've never really been in a room where I also really, really had that sad um, crying sensation, but there are times where I almost got angry for no reason. You know, I could really sense the frustration or it was really a frustration or more of a heavy energy that kind of came over me more more and mm -hmm. not, not at Ventfer, but at a couple other locations I've been. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I know what you mean. You have that heaviness, like almost in your chest. Yeah. Um, yeah. When, you, when you're in a certain room. Oh, and something else that I really wanted to mention. When, um, okay. at, the, at the very, very end of the evening, um, we were doing some glass swirling. And oh, yeah. Yeah. the group of girls that um, were participating in one of the sessions had been in the drawing room earlier and they had been communicating with somebody named... Brian? Um, Don't uh, ask me. Now you threw the name out of my head. <laughs> um, well, I forget the gentleman's name. Okay. Oh, it's so. When I when I was uh, first when we first landed at Ventford Hall, I went in and bought a book of the history of Ventford Hall. So when I got home after the investigation and I was reading it, mm -hmm. um, this is this is all related <laughs> so, because the girls had communicated with this gentleman. And they were trying to figure out where he fit in in the house because it wasn't a family name. Um, so he just, it, it was a random name. I want to say, let's call him Ken. I don't think that's the right name. But so we didn't know where this came from. And apparently when they were communicating with him, he came through to them that he didn't like the carpet that they had put down. And they had just put the carpet down two days before. So we don't think any more about it. I go home, I'm reading the history of Ventford Hall, and 
I'm seeing these photo credits to Ken underneath the pictures. And I'm like, oh my God, he was the photographer who would have spent a lot of time at Fenford Hall um, in those days, those early days when the Morgans lived there. Mm -hmm. And it, it was the height of high society. And they had just been built to Venford Hall and it was a very long, it's like a three-year process. So I, I thought that was kind of neat that I found that name. It was. Um, and I don't have my book with me, so. No, don't worry about it. So anyways, if anybody has any questions, they can uh, reach us in the Tojinet chat room or the Parax chat room or how about our audience here in the studio? Any questions, gentlemen? No? Okay. Nope. All right. So, uh, one other experience, and I'm not sure you were there or not. What was the room with all the pretty stuff that we shot most of the stuff for? Uh, Sarah's room. Sarah's the bedroom. room. Sarah's bedroom. We did a, uh, yes, you were there. Yes, there. I was, yeah. Yes, we had you some were. really good experiences in that We room. did a, uh, I don't know what you call it, a, a kumbaya. We held hands <laughs> and, uh, you know, try to talk to the spirits, but... We actually had one of the chairs in, in front of uh, the young kid that was to the uh, right of me and myself. The chair actually moved quite a bit. Right. And, uh, we, you know, we didn't notice it at all. So Quite a few things happened during that, and it's, it's interesting. Cause, oh, yeah, that's right. You know, Go ahead. Everybody, you know, picture, you know, this table or you know, something a little bit larger with lots of really nice ornate kind of museum pieces on it. Mm -hmm. We all were facing that, so it was like you said, a big kumbaya circle. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, while we were going through, we actually heard almost like a, a door shut. So oh, yeah. there's mm -hmm. a, like a, like a big double door, almost armoire um, furniture piece behind where you were standing, which almost like one of those doors just shut um, on its own. Uh, and then a, a good group of us actually, at least on the side I was, so mm -hmm. I was maybe a quarter of the circle around. So if you were at the 12... You were to the right of the... Yeah, if you were at the 12 o'clock of the circle, I would have been at like the 9 o'clock. And, you know, myself and a couple of the um, the women kind of off to my to my right, uh, they, we all could smell a very strong, floral, almost lilac perfume mm -hmm. start to come through. And it, it was very distinct, very pungent smell, you know, of this floral perfume. Did you smell that? I did not. The funny no. part about it, well, you were smelling that. I was actually smelling cigar smoke. You were getting cigar, yeah. yeah. And it could have been both of them making oh, yeah. their it way actually, around it, it the group. Very well could have been, but right. it, was, it was interesting that you said that. Yeah, it was a, an interesting experience, but that's one of those things. Is it, you know, is it really proof of anything? No, but it's, it, you know, it's what it's all about. It's the paranormal experience. It's the experience you can't explain. I think, you know, like you said, is it proof? Um, you know, one of the things I've been really preaching a lot about now in the paranormal community and the paranormal world is who are we trying to prove to? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you know, and so when we do something like that, you know, am I trying to prove to Joe Scientist down the street or am I trying to prove to myself and the people that are there with me? Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, the paranormal experience isn't like this thing flashing. The paranormal experience is exactly what that was, was smelling something that wasn't there, hearing something that shouldn't have been heard. So for those five people who were in the same, you know, 10 foot vicinity as me, that was proof to them. It may not be proof to to Joe, skeptic scientist, but you know those people didn't pay an admission ticket to prove anything to Joe, scientist. They <laughs> right. they paid an admission ticket to prove something to themselves, mm -hmm. you know. And then I do that to help maybe get the proof that they're looking for. So you know when you start throwing the, the you know when we start throwing the word proof around, I, I'm really starting to look at it differently as who am, who are we trying to prove to? And I think that was proof because it was proof for everybody in that circle who who did experience something. They left that night having a maybe a better understanding or can say they experienced something not normal, something paranormal. You know, that's their proof. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speaking, Absolutely. Speaking about proof, as Josh is talking, and now as, a, as I am talking, <laughs> the K2 meter is going. Okay, so is that necessarily a ghost in here? Or is it has something to do with us talking into the microphone No, it's going off anyways. I think it's just uh, a lot of electricity in this studio. Really? Wouldn't you think? It could be. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Perhaps these lights hanging above our heads and things like well, that. Yeah, but do you, uh, do you know, even know where the senses are on that? No idea. Do you know the range on that? 
Nope. Most people don't. That's a true story. Most people go around with all these gadgets that we're talking about and Josh was talking about, and they use them so easily and they swing them around and, and wave them, and they, they've never even read the instructions to start with, okay? Let's, you know, not even go farther than that. But they also don't know enough about them. For instance, the K2 meters, uh, my paranormal study, I have a paranormal study group that meets once a month at Circles of Wisdom in Andover. And one day what we did is we actually took a potpourri of EMF meters. Potpourri? You like that word? Potpourri? Pepper. No, a potpourri. A potpourri. A whole bunch. Uh, we took a whole bunch of... Potpourri. Whatever. A whole bunch. We took a whole bunch of the damn things, and we put an EMF pump, which I bought from uh, Joshua Mantel's group back in the day. Or maybe it wasn't you, it was uh, the other guy there. Yeah. Uh, and the guy who sold the rocks? Yeah. What was his I name? Have Paul. Paul. Someone else. Yeah, yeah so we had this, he had this EMF meter, I mean EMF pump, which is basically an EMF generator generates EMF. And so we put it on the, uh, against the wall, and then we took a, a, a yardstick. And we put the yardstick on the table. Mm -hmm. And the first thing we, we, we wanted to know is where the hell the sensors were on these things. So, for instance, if the sensors were on the side, it didn't make me go, you know, go like this trying to measure it. So it was easy, better to slide it sideways to it. Okay. So we actually started out and we slowly pushed it towards the EMF until it went off. And then we could actually measure the range of the uh, meter. And now what was it? That was a ghost. <laughs> I think there's a spirit Trying behind you. Ghost, yeah, I think. The ghost like yeah, and knock his suspenders yeah. off. Mm. So anyways. Now, can I see that K2 for a moment, please? Because this one, yeah. uh, what is this light on the side? Mine doesn't have a light a on the side. Light. Oh, it's just a flashlight? Yeah. They, oh, okay. You know, they improve. I have the strip. Apparently, I have the strip down model. I mean, I oh, don't well, know. Well, you think about it. Seriously, Josh, I mean, you know more than anyone. When we started out, first of all, you took a dime and shoved a dime in there, right? Because that's the way you kept it. You turned it in with a dime. or, Okay, so then they came up and they, they would doctor and put the toggle switch on the side. That's, what right? I, that's, one, that's mine. I still use still it. Still got the, the toggle doctor, switch, doctor right, switch, right. And then they put the, the one with it, like this one, it's, it's the switch. Yep. And then, of course, they put this on it, and now they have other ones with I've other actually, I, I, I was shopping around for some new equipment. They have one with the, um, that shadow detection I was just talking about. Built shadow into detection. Oh, well. my. Mm. Wow. One that measures temperature. <laughs> you know, it's all, it's all good, and, good and well, but I think the more and more advanced this equipment gets is it's drawing people mm. away from what, like, what I right. just said five minutes ago. It's drawing away from the personal experience that we're, we're actually looking for. Mm -hmm. That's so true. I want to talk to Josh about this. Uh, okay. There's a, a young lady that we both know. In fact, uh, I was introduced to her by, by you, Josh, and her name is, because I'm going to screw it up, you know that. Um, Jennifer. Jennifer. Jennifer Huberto. Huberto. And I might have just screwed it up too, but I think I That's got it right. Close <laughs> enough. So anyways, we, we talk about people with ghost hunters. They think they're crazy, you know, oh, what, you know, what do they do? Uh, but Could be. the people at Ventford Hall have always told... Josh and, and other people here that no one died in the building, correct? So Jennifer and her friend Amy, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, now I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. They went and did research, and they actually, uh, I think we have this in our machine. This is the death certificate. Yes, the death certificate one, still, please. Can we put that up, Russ, if, 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 if you have it, mm -hmm. please? Yeah. Okay, this there is, it is the actual death certificate of... George, George Hale Morgan. Right, George yes. Hale Morgan. And uh, he died of chronic Bright's disease. Oh. It's perhaps when the sun comes out too much. <laughs> Macadamia. <laughs> what? I don't know what the hell it says. What does it say? Myocardia. Myocardia. What does it say? Chronic Bright's disease. Uh, yeah, myocardia, several years. So there you go. He died at age 71, two months, and 14 days. And he died at Benford Hall. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, they actually had this birth certificate on him. And, and who is this George character? George was Sarah Morgan's husband who lived in the house. It was one of the, um, the uh, founding people who helped have the building built for them mm -hmm. for their summer cottage there you go summer cottage this place is like bigger than your house oh yes yes but this the interesting thing home. they they got the death certificate 
Mm -hmm. They came and they dug up the obituary. Really? Right. And also there was another piece that they sent me as well, but I couldn't read it because it was too tiny in the print. So here you have ghost hunters doing what they do, investigating if they do it right. properly. Mm -hmm. And they change, they change history. That is, that is great because they didn't know. I mean, but when you think about it back in the day, you know, um, many people died at home. Yeah. You know, they didn't go to the hospital. Right. Um, and that's, that's just simply what happened. And that, that is awesome that they did that research and they found that. I mean, it, it goes to show you, uh, you can't really be a paranormal investigator, ghost hunter, whatever you want to call this that we do, and not be an amateur historian at the same mm, time. Right. Um, because what we're looking for and what we're looking at is in the past. So you have to be able to dig into that past to really you know, validate what we may have experienced. And the other thing that, that um, irritates me extremely uh, is, you know, that... Besides uh, me? No, you don't. You don't. <laughs> I mean, how can I possibly be irritated at that? I just don't know. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Steve Parsons, who uh, is the founder of Parascience in the UK and a big hit on Japanese TV, evidently. Oh. Uh, so he... Uh, he believes that all orbs are just non-paranormal, okay? So that's, that's his, his creed. In fact, our show is a non-orb so show. It's, uh, it's a no-orb show, no-orb show, no-orb <laughs> zone, that's what it is. So anyways, no but at uh, Ventford for Hall, when I was with you, uh, there was a gentleman from another paranormal group, and he had taken some U, um, IR video and showed an orb going in there, and it was blinking like a B-52. Really? Yeah, and going, and it said it came, started over a Bible, which really meant something to this person. Mm -hmm. And he says, I know what you guys think of orbs, but can you take a look at this? And I said, absolutely. So uh, I uh, messaged uh, Steve Parsons, and he said, uh, it's an orb. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> but see, He's not doing his due diligence. I mean, okay, you don't believe in it, but someone gives you a piece of what they want to know about, you have to look at it and say, okay, this is what it is. And why? Not just say, it's a new orb, it's dust, okay? Well, why was it blinking? As it turns out, Steve gave a very good uh, explanation for it, which is that the orb was a, a piece of dust that was flat rather than round or, or any... any um, shape to it. Okay. And so in the motion, because there is air motion, actually, these suspenders keep falling <laughs> off. <laughs> Anyways, uh, <laughs> we're going to get glue them next time. Uh, we'll pin them. Mm. So anyways, in. There, there are air currents in, in house and in studio and <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Thank you. And so basically, the particle was rotating. So the, the light, IR light from the, the camera would, it. would reflect, it yeah. would light up, it would disappear, light okay. up, and disappear. So it made logic, but you know, we're investigators, let's investigate. When we get some evidence, let's just not tick it off and say, okay, that's, that's because there's orbs or things. At least look at it and tell a person why. So okay. that's my little thing on that. I mean, All do right. you agree with that, Joshua? Right, uh, it's, sometimes it's tough because you, I do, I do the same thing. You know, sometimes I catch myself, it's just dust and, and shoo it away. Um, but then when I try to get an explanation, I can watch people's eyes start to gloss over mm -hmm. <laughs> as I start getting too technical <laughs> with it. Like, you know, um, it, it's orbs are, are is just a touchy subject. I am not a believer or, or proponent of them. Mm -hmm. But if somebody comes and asks me to, to critique their orb picture, it's always a very awkward moment. Um, right. because you don't know what that picture means for that specific person. And it's only really tough for me because there, there have been moments. As you my, found out in my paranormal study group, Yes, right? you know, that as well as, you know, a quick story where um, I was speaking at a, a public library in upstate New York, and this woman came to me with a picture of a, a, a younger child riding a, a horse and on a dirt road full of dust, you know, uh, and yeah. there was an orb right over the kid's so uh, shoulder. And I was like, well, you know, on a dirt road. And... The dust probably kicked up. She was like, 
oh no, that's my husband. You know, he passed away or before. And I was like, the fact uh, that I told her I wasn't her husband was devastating to her. Mm -hmm. And I really, like, I ruined her month. Uh, you know, and it, that I felt bad. So I really now try to stay away from fielding those questions in, in, a, in a way that can hurt whoever's um, asking it. Well, that's the thing that's about Robson, which why I hate him, is that I know that, you know, 99% of them are perhaps a dust particles, water vapor, okay. you know, in the orb zone of the cameras, there's a, you know, all the, the regular thing. Mm -hmm. But when someone comes in like that woman and says, shows you a picture of an orb and says, that's my husband, that's my grandfather, that's my son, mm -hmm. it's, to them, that's what it is. Yeah. And, and I certainly wasn't there when the picture was taken. And, and probably it's, it's all of the dust and all and that. But how do I really know and, and how can I really say that that's exactly what it was to her? Right. Because if we believe that spirits can put um, their voices on a recorder, right? Mm -hmm. right. Why can't they manifest or can move an object or appear? or do this and that, why couldn't they show themselves as a dust particle that meant something to a person? That's the whole thing. It means something. It's not like, you know, oh, there's a spirit there. They tell you exactly who that spirit is. So that's why I, I hate OBS, and, um, but I understand it. I understand the photographs of it. I understand both ends of the science and the spiritual ends, especially with that means so much to, to people. So. And, and Josh, by the way, uh, he he did a great job. Maybe nobody was doing this back in the day. Is he actually uh, classified orbs and and light anomalies? And mm -hmm. he did a, a. I mean, I was very impressed. You still have that presentation. I, st I still have that presentation. It's it's. I'm actually critiquing a little bit mm -hmm. now. Um, I actually did a, you know a lot of independent research in on on orb photography, where I actually took a lot of little styrofoam balls and place them in different places around a room to use use them as trigger objects to it kind of proved the point where that a uh, orb is never actually where it is based on the two-dimensional view of a picture you know in the size of it makes it look closer or further away from the camera than it actually is so mm -hmm. it, it i use it to help kind of demonstrate mm -hmm. you know how everything in a picture is not what it appears to be mm -hmm. he mentions the two-dimensional uh aspect of it which is why um Steve's group came up with a 3D camera, yeah. and it, it's really cool because if they are two-dimensional, you won't catch them on both of them. It's actually a double camera to one. Right. It's, it's pretty cool. Uh, we went to Hammond Castle, and, and of course they were on Ghost Hunters, and they, right. you can sit in the spot where they actually had the seances and the Faraday cage and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And this is the orb spot where you get the people get all these orbs all the time. So. Uh, you know, spirits are there. So he took a picture of his camera, and of course it was only on one, so therefore it was uh, whatever. And uh, so he shows it to the guy, and the guy says, yeah, yeah, you got one right there. <laughs> He's like so excited, so whatever. Right, but, you, yeah, you know, orbs, are, it's like, I just hate them. Yeah, that's simple as that. <laughs> so Josh, I know we're, we're, we're uh, coming down to the end of the show. Um, What's uh, new and ahead for you with for Ventford Hall and um, Berkshire Paranormal? Uh, we're still um, working with them. Uh, we don't have anything set in stone as of yet. Uh, there is going to be something in the, the fall season, maybe a couple different events, um, where I might actually put on some programs, um, daytime programs as opposed to like all night ghost hunting. Really? Um, you know, getting different types of uh, either spiritualist things or presentations during the day, maybe out on the lawn if it's nice enough. Oh, so a couple nice. different programs mm -hmm. on top of maybe a... Face a, painting? Face painting. <laughs> face um, painting. I don't think two so. Two-hour drive? <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Maybe, uh, maybe a ghost hunt at night. We'll, we'll, you know, we're, we're looking to downsize versus what we did our last time. We actually had 58 people. Right, um, we're going to actually downsize to maybe about 20, 20 25 max. Um, um, That's because you sold off. You, I started off with thirty or something. You sold off like that, yeah, right? Yeah, we sold it. We sold. We sold it in less than two hours. So yeah, you know, there was a demand. We tried to meet the demand, and it backfired a little bit. But we're so we're going to downsize a little bit, but offer some more programs um, during the day, things along those lines. Mm -hmm. We are going to eventually get up some private overnight ghost hunts um, for just gr specific groups to be able to come in and do some investigating. Mm -hmm. um, I'm 
going out, uh, going to be speaking at, I know, the Berlin Town Library in Berlin, New York. So that's a, a long haul for anybody kind of in this area of Massachusetts. But, you know, um, I'm available to, to go out, you know, over the course of the Halloween season as normal and <laughs> different places and speak. I always enjoy that time of year. So how can people uh, reach you, Josh? Um, there are a couple of different ways. I have my own personal webpage, uh, kind of disattached from Berkshire Paranormal, which is jmantello.com. Um, any information on how to book me for any pri uh, private events or if you have a haunted mansion. So I've worked with haunted mansions. If you have a haunted mansion and need some help with it, um, I can help you with that as well. But, you know, any sort of private events or lectures or anything like that is available. Plus, um, I, I do a lot of different photography, so there's actually a lot of my, my uh, photography is on there. Um, you can contact me through Berkshire Paranormal at BerkshireParanormal.com. Um, my email is josh at berkshireparanormal.com mm -hmm. or jmantello at msn.com. I have my countless emails and web pages. So. find you everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. Right. You know, it's interesting, though, and, you know, people say, well, i got a haunted mansion. I can do this myself. Uh, it's not that easy, is it, Josh? Yes. And you learn by lessons because, believe it or not, not all groups out there are reputable. No. <laughs> no. Um, really? It's a true story. True story. Oh. <laughs> no, and it's it's unfortunately something some people have to learn the the hard way. Um, I've learned it the hard way myself. You know who who to trust and who not to trust, um, and why. You know, sometimes it's, it's one of those things, and it's a question you got to always ask any kind of group that that's into the paranormal. Why are you doing this? Are you doing it for your own personal gain? Are you doing it to become the next celebrity ghost hunter? Or there's too many got people out there. I think trying to be the next TV star on. You know, whatever oh, popular Russian. network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. Because there, there aren't enough paranormal shows. We, we'd like to star in some more, but... Uh, right. <laughs> That's why we started our show, so we could wear hats. That's right, so we could wear so hats. We like wearing hats. And be rich and famous. <laughs> no, not only about the rich and so famous, but there. we get to wear hats. That's all I care about. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we do, we do need to wrap up. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, overall, I think that our experience at Bentford Hall was wonderful. The Absolutely. place is amazing and fantastic. If you can get out to Lennox Mass, uh, pay it a visit. You know, they do tours during the day um, and they'd be more than happy to have you come in and, you know, bring your, bring your K2 meter or whatever along and, you know, but, see mean, what happens. It's, it's not all about ghost hunting either. No. It's, it's no, about it's learning beautiful. the history. Yeah. I mean, that's, it is that's a historical the history. and beautiful location. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Yes, it is. And if you saw the opening, you'll know why. <laughs> so anyways, we want to thank uh, Josh Mantello from uh, Berkshire Paranormal. And uh, we really appreciate you coming all the way down here. It's a good drive Oh, him. yes. Yep. So uh, thank you, Josh. Thank you. I appreciate it. I always uh, enjoy coming out here and hanging out with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> So you're like, awesome. Oh, wait till he's driving home. I know, right, right, and the two-hour ride home. So I guess we got to wrap it up. We do, we do. But thank you for uh, joining us again for another show, and we're looking forward to many, many more to come. Goodbye. Goalies to ghosties, long leggedy beasties, and things that go bump in the night. Deliver us, good Lord.